at the end of World War II, the United States is the lone superpower in the world. The Soviet Union is the second most powerful nation, but it is a distant second, especially economically. The United States is the only country that wasn't invaded and destroyed in any significant way. And it is the only country with the atomic bomb for a little while. So the rest of the world, Asia, Europe, it is completely devastated. And it will take decades to recover. And most of the countries will only be able to recover because the United States provides a lot of economic assistance. Now, no one thought the United States and the Soviet Union were going to get along when World War II ended, but no one thought the Cold War would begin immediately afterwards. And as soon as World War II ended, the Cold War would begin almost immediately. Overall, Cold War will last from 1947 to about 1991, and it will dominate everything about American life. And during this period, it is Cold War because the two major combatants do not go directly head to head to fight each other. Instead, it is a lot of suspicion and a ton of fear. And that fear is based on the fact that at any moment the entire world could be blown completely out of existence. It's called mutual assured destruction. The only reason the two major world powers did not go to the war is because they will both be stockpiling so many nuclear weapons that they can completely wipe out the entire world. Uh, so, one of my favorite Einstein quotes, is, World War III will be fought with nuclear weapons, World War IV with sticks and stones. So, the entire period we're talking about, it is one that is dominated by fear. Fear does not make people do rational things very often. Fear is quite often irrational. And what all of this came down to was perspective. Once the Cold War ended, uh, journalists went to the former Soviet Union, went to Russia, and you know, asked, well, why were you guys pointing nuclear weapons at America? And they said, you guys were pointing weapons at us. Both sides will insist that they are the ones on the defensive. So it was a matter of perspective. As a generalization, during this period, within the United States, there is uh, the two parties will have a general consensus. They will have some differences, but there will be a general consensus. Uh, first and foremost, Socialism and communism is bad and it is dangerous and it's trying to spread and it is a threat to American democracy and freedom. So both parties will view socialism and communism as a threat. As a generalization, uh, Republicans will constantly accuse Democrats of being weak on communism, and uh, it's very interesting. A lot of Republican presidents, they will actually be the ones to enact uh, treaties and to actually negotiate with, uh, with the Soviet Union, which that's a good thing. And Democrats, they will actually quite often take tougher positions than Republicans, and not even in a good way, like, for example, the Vietnam War. So uh, rhetoric aside, both parties will agree 
that socialism and communism needs to be kept in check because it's dangerous. Second thing both parties will generally agree on is the welfare state. The one created during the New Deal. Neither side will try to completely dismantle it. There will be a general agreement that it is the role of the government to provide, when I say welfare, what it means is a basic standard of living, a minimum standard of living. In the United States of America, people should not be able to starve to death. That is, that is what's meant by like a welfare state. So welfare, people always think just handing money, but there's, as you well know from the New Deal lecture, there's a lot of different kinds of welfare. So both parties will generally agree on that. And uh, so they will not differ nearly as much as they will uh, after, especially after the Cold War, especially after 1980. So how did this all start? Where did it start? And why did it start? Cold War will begin in Eastern Europe and in Germany. From the perspective of the United States, the Cold War began because the Soviet Union said that they were going to put democratic governments in Eastern Europe, and Germany was supposed to be united. Soviet Union will not do that. So according to the United States, Soviet Union went back on uh, their agreement. And also uh, Stalin and the communists did talk about spreading communism. So they will see that as a threat. In fairness to the Soviet Union, they will see this as a need for security. Russia had been invaded multiple times in the last hundred years, and it is always from Europe through those Eastern European countries. Germany alone had uh, inflicted a lot of damage, and the Soviet U Union is the one that took the brunt of the damage from the Germans during World War II. They took it overwhelmingly more damage and had more loss than any other nation. And it is not even close. So they did the brunt of the fighting, they did the brunt of the destroying of the Nazis, and they will be just absolutely decimated. So uh, the United States, as soon as World War II ends, Truman will take a get tough position. Again, it's because he's a Democrat and he was on the defensive. Uh, a lot of presidents though, will take a get tough, even in situations where diplomacy would have been better and diplomacy was an option. They'll take a get tough stance. So as soon as the war ends, the United States immediately cuts off all aid to Russia, lend lease, Again, Russia, the Soviet Union was just devastated from World War II. So the United States will take a very tough position. And uh, by 1947, Winston Churchill will come to the United States and he will talk about an iron curtain that is separating Western democracies from the Soviet Union. It was a generalization. Most historians agree. Soviet Union started the Cold War. The United States will do a lot of things, though, to exacerbate it and make it worse. There will be a lot of instances where a diplomacy would have made things better. And Americans will take a get tough stance. Soviet Union, Union obviously does things to make it worse. Uh, but so will the United States. So that is the backdrop. Now, obviously, the first thing that needs to be done, though, is there has to be a policy. What is America's policy against the Soviet Union going to be during the Cold War? That will be created by a 
foreign policy planner with the State Department. State Department, that is the Secretary of State's office. Secretary of State, of course, as you know, is the most important cabinet level position overseeing all foreign policy. And the foreign policy planner that will come up with it is a guy named George Kennan. And the policy is containment. You must know that. The policy of containment is the policy that will dictate America's actions throughout the entire Cold War. And the idea behind containment was the United States needed to contain communism, stop it from spreading. Do not attack the Soviet Union directly. Do not attack it directly. Do not fight it directly. Just stop it from spreading. The idea behind this is communism and socialism inherently contain the seeds of their own destruction because they are such bad political and economic systems. So if they can't spread, then they will die out. So that is the policy that the United States will take. Uh, just an interesting side note, it is the same idea uh, Abraham Lincoln had regarding slavery. Don't attack slavery where it exists, don't stop it where it exists, just stop it from spreading. And slavery contains, it, it, slavery is a bad economic system, so it'll eventually go away. And is Kennan right about, so uh, is Kennan right about communism and socialism containing so many weaknesses? Fundamentally, yes. Socialist and communist governments do not work. They have never worked. So I suppose some point maybe there will be one that works but as a general uh, up to this point it has never worked even when we see ones that are successful for a while they'll have a few decades of doing well and then they will have a massive decline we saw that with the soviet union uh by the 70s, 70s and 80s their economy was already on the decline and it wasn't even america's fault or america wasn't even responsible just because so, socialism and communism do not work in practice. And the same thing currently is happening with China. So containment is the policy that will be adopted and it is adopted and enacted very soon after George Kennan proposed it in Europe, specifically Greece and Turkey. Greece will have a communist uprising and Turkey will start getting a lot of pressure from the Soviet Union, military pressure from the Soviet Union to uh, give up control of the passage from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Now the reason this happened in these two places is because they were economically devastated from the war. Remember, socialist, socialism and communism spring from bad economies, well, radicalism in general, fascism, socialism, communism, uh, they spring from bad economies. They spring from economic desperation. So in order to stop this, Truman will come up with the Truman Doctrine. And this allocates $400 million to Greece and Turkey so they can bolster their economies uh, and defend themselves against uh, Soviet aggression and communism. And it works perfectly. A massive influx of money and it stabilizes both countries. So it works fantastically well. The Truman Doctrine is the first time in US history the United States will give money for military assistance to a nation in a time of peace. Since this time, the United States has give, gives weapons and money to countries all over the world, but this is the very first time. So right off the bat, the United States is breaking, in terms of foreign policy, it's breaking with its entire history. The Truman Doctrine was so successful that uh, the government will then turn to bolstering the rest of Europe. If you remember, after World War I, Europe was decimated. 
the United States took a position of, well, it's your fault. You guys started the war, so uh, you need to fix it. And that turned out to be a disaster. So Americans actually learned from World War I and will come up with a policy to provide assistance to the rest of Europe. The author of it was this guy right here, George Marshall. He is the Secretary of State, so the guy in charge of foreign policy. Um, Marshall, uh, George Marshall is descendant of John Marshall, the most important Supreme Court Justice in all of US history. And he will come up with the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan will provide $12 billion to the countries of Europe. So the United States told Europe, hey, tell us how much money you need. And the countries of Europe will send in requests and the United States will provide it. And this worked amazingly well. So instead of letting all Europe just crumble, which would have led to the rise of extremism again, the United States provided $12 billion of assistance, which obviously in that time was an insane amount of money. This worked incredibly well. The United States was counting on the countries of Eastern Europe to also request money, which they did, uh, well, uh, say they wanted to, but they were controlled by the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union would not allow them to because the United States had cut off aid to Russia. So it's to the Soviet Union. So Eastern Europe will not get the benefits of it. And to this day, Eastern Europe is still uh, economically much, much worse off than Western Europe. And big reason for that starts here. So the Marshall Plan will work out fantastically well and it'll stabilize the Western democracies. So the United States is now batting two for two. When it came to Germany, there was an agreement that the military commanders in each one of the regions were going to unite and make Germany into one country before again. So they were supposed to all unite together. And when the Marshall Plan passed, the countries of West Germany and the countries of Western Berlin, or the region of Western Berlin, they got money from the Marshall Plan, but Eastern Germany and Eastern Berlin did not. Just a reminder, Eastern Germany is controlled by the Soviet Union. Berlin, the capital of Germany, is in the Eastern zone. And so Berlin, the capital itself, is divided into fours. So uh, the city of Berlin is divided into fours, but it is in Eastern, it is in Eastern Europe. So in Germany, the Western Germany will be given money, they'll be given weapons, and this really pisses off Eastern Germany. This really, really pisses off the Soviet Union. So much so that uh, Soviet Union will cut off all land access to Berlin. So the Soviet Union will say no vehicles are allowed to drive through Eastern Europe or Eastern Germany. So uh, Western Germany countries, the United States, England, and France would send goods and supplies to uh, Western Berlin through trucks. But the Soviet Union will cut that off. And when they do that, the United States will enact the Berlin Airlift. I know I've mentioned this before, but the United States is bar none the single best nation in terms of logistics. Logistics, the movement of men and material. Uh, and the reason the United States is the best in the world with, when it comes to logistics is because we have to geography. We have to cross the Atlantic and Pacific just to get to wars. Uh, and also because the United States is so rich costs a lot of money. So the U.S. will create the Berlin Airlift. And for one year, we will send planes around the clock to Berlin, providing everything, 
And when I say everything, I mean everything. Uh, planes are going nonstop uh, for over a year in just this continuous pattern. They would land and sometimes they'd be on the ground for like 60 seconds, a minute and a half maybe, and have, there'd be people load, unloading it so fast and then they'd take off. And for a year, this app continued. It was a logistical miracle, not miracle, but I mean, it was just one of the most brilliant logistical maneuvers. Uh, they even created an entire air force. I mean, brought in every single piece of material so they could build a new airport. Uh, it's amazing. The Berlin airlift worked fantastically well. Uh, it drove the Soviets crazy because obviously the Soviets have no, uh, you know, Soviet radars, they just see all these planes continuously going. And uh, for all they know, one of them could have been carrying a nuclear bomb at some point. Uh, wasn't obviously, but uh, for the Soviet Union, they had to constantly be paying attention to what was happening and constantly be watching all these planes. So after a year of this, they will eventually lift the blockade and Eastern Germany and Western Germany will become separate, separate countries. They will remain separated for uh, more than well, about, um, about 50 years. And because Eastern Germany is so much more poor because the Soviet unions have so much less money, uh, the people of Eastern Germany, Germany, Eastern Berlin, will try to flee to the West. They try, people in Berlin, Eastern Berlin, will try to flee to Western Berlin so they can be transported to Western Germany because Eastern Germany was just much more poor, lower level of education. And to stop this, the Soviets will, of course, create the Berlin Wall. So they have to force people to not leave because uh, especially the best and the brightest uh, will be leaving. The Soviets even say they are having a brain drain uh, of people from the east to the west. To this day, Eastern Germany, Eastern Berlin, it still has higher rates of poverty, higher rates of illiteracy. Uh, not surprisingly also, it's where there is uh, fascist movements are growing. Those tend to grow in places with lower levels of education. So overall, uh, this was unfortunate, but still was a win for the United States, uh, especially the Berlin Airlift. So the United States is now batting three for three. It then had to unify the Western democracies. So in order to do that, the United States will lead in the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Originally, this only included 12 countries. Uh, today, it has 32 countries, and it is a mutual defense alliance, which means an attack on one is an attack on all. And this is a permanent military alliance. It is really important because the last permanent military alliance the United States had was with the French from the American Revolution. The French alliance, that was a per permanent military alliance that ended in eight, uh, 1800. So when Washington left, left office in his farewell address, he warned against entanglements in foreign affairs and called for isolation. And the United States had remained uh, isolationist, well, I should say without a permanent military alliance, for 150 years, even World War I, World War II, the alliances the United States had were not permanent. They're only for the duration of the war. NATO will even have, will have its own uh, military, and this also pisses off the Soviet U Union. So the Soviet Union would create the Warsaw Pact, and a lot of the countries that are in the Warsaw Pact they didn't even want to be in there. Soviet Union puts in puppet governments that they will control. NATO and NATO will 
be partially responsible for the longest period in human history right now. We are going through the longest period in human history where two major world powers have not gone directly to war with each other. And NATO will work fantastically well. There are people that think we should get rid of NATO. Uh, I will, you won't be tested on this, but I will just say clearly, that is an insane idea. NATO has worked fantastically well in ensuring long-term peace, uh, general peace and stability. Obviously there have been wars, but they are satellite wars in uh, satellite areas on the peripheries, not two major world powers going directly head to head. So this was a fantastic success. So the United States is now going uh, five for five. It then had to bolster its internal defenses. In order to do that, to create a national defense establishment, the government will pass the National Security Act. And this creates the uh, defense establishment that the United States has to this day. It's changed a little bit, but this is the basic outline of the defense establishment of the United States to this day. First, it created the U.S. Air Force. The U Air Force had been a part of the Army. It was part of the Army Air Force, but now the Air Force is, it is its own branch. Created the Central Intelligence Agency. That is the nerve center for intel uh, international intelligence gathering during the Cold War. So the CIA will be incredibly important. FBI, that is for domestic uh, intelligence gathering. CIA is international intelligence gathering. We'll also create the National Security Council. The National Security Council is an organization that co coordinates the national, or coordinate all national security. So it includes the head of all the military departments, uh, the head of the uh, Department of Defense, but it also includes the heads of the CIA, the FBI, and the State Department, or one in charge of foreign policy. So the National Security Council, it is the heads of all of the intelligence military agencies, uh, and Secretary of State, and of course the President. It is, it is what will organize all national defense issues. And it also, the United States also created the Department of Defense. Department of Defense will consolidate all the military branches. The military branches were notorious for fighting against each other and like undermining each other's efforts because they're always competing. So this will consolidate all the military agencies. And from the beginning of the country, the United States, uh, first three cabinet positions in U.S. history, Secretary of State, Secretary of uh, the Treasury, and Secretary of War. This is where we get rid of the Secretary of War. It became, becomes the Secretary of Defense. What's the difference? Sounds better. It's a PR move. We're a defensive people. So those damn Soviets that are the offensive people. So Department of Defense will organize, the mil consolidate and organize the military branches specifically. So this establishes the basic framework for national defense during the Cold War. The United States will then, uh, due to a series of setbacks that we'll talk about shortly, Truman will ask for national security uh, recommendations. Recommendation to look at U.S. Um, strategy. And the most important document, the most important document that will be the statement of America's foreign policy is NSC Paper 68, National Security Council Paper 68. This will shape U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War. And it is, says a lot of things, but the three really important ones for our purposes. First, it says the United States needs to stop 
communism with massive military force. It calls for massive military force. Second, the United States needs a bigger bomb. We have uh, the atomic bomb, but you know, it's just not big enough. So it will call for and it will fund the creation of the H-bomb or the hydrogen bomb. So we will get a bigger bomb. And third, really importantly, called for military spending. So it will call for putting the United States economy in military spending mode, even though it is technically at a, in a time of peace. So the U.S. military spendings will go to wartime levels. We'll go from something like 13 billion to around 50 billion. This is so important to know because one of the most important things any country can do is war. And this goes all the way back to Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Um, wars are always expensive. And if you took the first half of my class, it's why the American Revolution started because the French and Indian War was so expensive. Wars are just incredibly expensive. From 1941, when the United States entered the well, really from 39 with the Lend-Lease Act, the U.S. economy has essentially been running on wartime levels. The U.S. economy uh, has been essentially on wartime footing. Today, the United States is 4.2% of the world's population and spends about I think 38 to 39% of all military expenditures, expenditures in the world. So that is a major departure from all of U.S. history before that. And the amount of money just continues to grow. And even when it is not necessary, more money will go to the military. Uh, and it is the consistent theme of the U.S. economy from one of the themes from this point on is continuous military spending. Now, overall, the important thing to understand about NSC Paper 68 is it emphasizes the United States needs to be militarily aggressive, militarily and economically aggressive, military over diplomacy. So this establishes a way the United States will handle the Cold War. And again, just to repeat from earlier, there will be many instances where diplomacy would have worked better, but the United States will take a very militaristic stance, a very militaristic position, and uh, that will dominate U.S. foreign policy for the next half century.